All right, so um, what we're going to oh, what we're going to do today is um, a review uh, for the final, and I'm going to go over some uh, basic uh, the basic plan of the final and some basic things you need to know, and then go over some uh, review problems. But uh, some people asked a question about the uh, homework last night. So here it is, this question. So it says, um, so it gives you below are seven randomly generated XY pairs, and they tell you that the Spearman rank order correlation coefficient, not the, the Spearman one, is negative 0.11. So that tells you you don't have all these you just have integers between 1 and 7. All these numbers, for example, and they're in order here. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so then all you have to do is put the y ones in order. So for example, um, what's the smallest one? This will be rank 1, right? So this would change, 26, 5 would change to 2, 1. And then the next smallest is this one, so this would be 6, 2, etc. Now, once they're in ranks, you're just looking for which of these following ones, when you put them in ranks, will also give you the same, the same points. Does that make sense? So it's really not that hard. Like here, you could go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right. So there you have the 7, and you also have the same y values. So this one has to be true. So you're just supposed to look for little tricks like that. All right? Um, does, that mean, do, does that answer your question, everyone? Put it into ranks. Then that's the whole point, that once you put, change the values into rankings between the numbers 1 and 7, you just see, you just look for the same seven pairs. Do you want me to go further with this, anybody, or do you understand now how to do it? How many? Yes. So is the fourth one true because the fourth one. Oh yeah, that's a good that's a good observation. Yeah, everything's exactly the same, but you just subtracted one off the y values, so it has to be the same. Good good observation. Yeah. Exactly. And this one, um, this one gave you all the y values. And do you have the same? It's just. So this gave you the same x's, and then it ordered the y's already for you, so it made it easier. Okay. okay. Just know that I don't make you do a lot of tedious calculations in this course. There's got to be an easier way of doing it. Yes? Will you give up the SDX and the SDY on the final? Yeah. Yes. I would give you the SDX and the X, SDX and the SDY. All right, because some people have calculators that do it, and some people might not, and so forth. Any other questions? All right, so I think, um, so first off, since we're here at the, let's, uh, I want to show you that if you go to Compass now, um, I have this little folder here for final exam materials, and um, it tells you first, it gives you, um, just, you can look at course summary materials, and you can, um, here's a breakdown of, of the, let's see, so for example, what is this? So this just says that basically these are the, the different methods that we've been using so far. We've been using, when we've been predicting a quantitative y, we, you know, with a single x, and whether it was, uh, do you want me to go over this, or do you want to read this on your own? You can read this on your own, right? The outline? Yeah, you can just read that. On. And if you have any questions about it, we have a whole other review next time. It's much better if you just read it on your own. You're not going to be quizzed on this, like filling out this chart or anything like it. It's just to give you an overview of what we've been doing. All right. So um, let's see what else we have under final. 
And this is a summary for the final. So you can look at this. And let me just look at. So this is just, again, we've had this unifying theme of building predictive models. So I thought I would just write something um, to unify what we've been doing, just a summary. So you can read that on your own. If you have any questions about it, you can talk, we can talk about it on our next review on Tuesday. So now what else is up here? Um, so this, I'm sure you want to know this. It covers, OK, so the final is Scantron. Unlike the one in your, unlike your other exams, this is all multiple choice. So um, no calculated answers. It's just multiple choice, all of it. And because uh, we don't have enough time to grade it. The TAs are all busy in, during finals week, and they don't want to grade it. And I can't grade them all, so this is how we're doing it. I apologize, but in some ways, it's an advantage. Because um, lots of times, if you're, you, know, you can eliminate answers, and it might be, for some people, it's easier. So this is your only multiple choice test. Now, um, it's very similar to the final practice final. A lot of that is multiple choice already in your notebook. So I've just pretty much changed everything to multiple choice. Um, so now, um, OK, so here I tried to, I've pretty much written all of it. And this is how it breaks down so far. 24% is on exam one material. 33% is on exam two material. That was a bit longer exam two. 30, 23 on exam three. And then even though the non-parametric stuff was really short, I wanted to include at least one fifth of it on that because uh, you haven't been tested on it elsewhere. So 20% is on that. All right. And the formulas that will be given on the final, you can click here. They're the same exact ones that are in your practice exam, the yellow practice exam and the notes. And it's very similar to the midterms and the practice final. Um, it's the same formulas you got on the, you can just look, can look at it. I mean, it's just exactly what we did before. These are just the new ones from the non-parametrics, and these are the ones you've been given before. All right, um, let's see. So what's on Lon Kappa? Well, um, if you, have a ex you have a lot of time to study. So this is if you want to really study everything. If you just decide you have other courses you want to spend more time on, and you just want to not spend as much time on this one, then I strongly recommend you do these two. And then see what, after you do these, I mean, I don't want you to do it that way, but realistically, I'm sure some of you have a lot harder classes and are just going to not spend as much time. But don't ever, don't skip those two. And for sure, you know, do practice homework and look at the practice exams for problems you're not sure about. Go ahead. OK, a couple of questions. I have to remember to repeat the questions for the online people, so go ahead. Very good question. The first question is about the conceptual understanding. Do you recommend looking at the summaries for the chapters? Yes, I do recommend looking at the summaries for the chapters. The summaries will give you the, like, the summaries will also give you um, not only the conceptual understanding, but they'll give you in very compact form the uh, basic formulas you need to know and the reasoning behind them. So it's, if you get the conceptual stuff, you often will get the formulas too. So for example, right here, I say see pages 114 and 122 for the summary of the basic ANOVA formulas you need to do. And there I also summarize sort of how ANOVA and linear regression are the same, it's a, you know, unifying things. So yes, I strongly, those are probably summary pages that I picked out there. So yeah, read the summaries for sure. And another good thing to do is to know the conceptual problems that were asked on all the um, exams. Like what the meaning of a p-value is, for example, et cetera. OK? That, what's the meaning of a hypothesis test? What's the type 1 error mean? All that stuff. Yeah. And that's her number. That's one question. What's your second? Uh, the second question is about the notebook. Are we still getting any credit for filling it out? I think it was mentioned earlier. Of course.
course you're getting credit for filling it out. I mean, of course you are getting credit in what you do, both online and in, pe in person. People, most of you are going to be taking the final on campus, right? Um, you know, here, if we look at our schedule here, where's our schedule? Um, Hit what? Where, where is it? Final exam materials, formulas. I closed it out. Ah, yeah. oh, sorry. Anyways, right, you know, you're going to be taking it on campus. And, um, right. Okay, I haven't announced where, but all of you, ex except for a handful, are going to be taking it either this Friday morning. Uh, half of you will be in this room, half of you will be in 314 Altgeld. Or uh, you're going to be taking it as a conflict that same night, or you're taking it online um, using ProctorU. Everyone, all of you will have the opportunity, well, if you're taking it in person, just bring your notebook to the final and we'll grade it while you're taking your exam and give it back to you when you leave. You'll all get your exam back and you'll see what, if you got full credit or not. And I'll explain which pages you can skip. I'll send you an email. Any pages we didn't cover in class, you can skip. So I'll send you out an email about that. So uh, if you're the, online, the few people are taking in ProctorU in other countries and elsewhere, um, just, uh, you can just upload a video. Just flip through the notebook and um, upload a vid video to, of you doing that to Google Drive and share it with me. I'll send you instructions instructions how to do that. Any other questions? All right. So, um, yeah, don't for, you, you'll find out exactly how much the grading is worth if you go to, so you just go to uh, grading, how much the notebook's worth, and it will tell you. It's 20 bonus points. Um, you can click here for a grade calculator. I know you have limited time. You can put in your exam grades. Your homework percentage is the same one we used for STAT 100. And uh, your bonus percentage so far, you can, you'd have to estimate the bonus percentage, you know, including if you're going to turn in a notebook or not. You can see what difference it makes, what you want for your overall grade, and it will tell you what you need on the final. So, yes. Somewhere between 80 and 100. I haven't finished it yet. OK. All right, any other? The question, I'm sorry for those watching. The question was, how many questions, how many bubbles are you going to fill in on the Scantron? You know, because each, there's not, so I said between 80 and 100 bubbles you'll fill in. Not that many questions, but the questions have parts too. So let's see, anything else? Um, let's see. So, uh, okay, so there's one more survey that's due. Did you, if you noticed on the calendar, we have one more survey due. No more homework due. We just have, let's check it out, we just have a bonus R problem, if you want to do that, on non-parametric tests, and we have a bonus survey 5 due. And um, those are both due the last day of classes. And if you want, if you need to sign up for a conflict, do so on Lon Kappa. Conflict means taking it that night. And if you can't do that, if you have three finals in a row and you can't do that, we have another option to take it uh, the following week. So you can just check that out on Lon Kappa. Or to take it on Proctor U if you absolutely, or if you're away or something. Okay, so um, any other questions so far. All right, so now let's go back to what, what I said about the final exam materials. All right, so this practice final is the same one that's in your notebook with a key if you just want another blank copy of it. Um, now, let's see. So the question is, let's, let's go to the document camera, I want to ask, I want to see how many of you have done these practice problems and what you want me to concentrate on. So let's go to the 
document camera right now. And let's look at these practice prob problems on non-parametric tests um, right here. Um, we could do those if you'd like, go through those quickly, just so that we could make sure everybody knows how to do those. And um, now the question is this. We have a whole, you have a, how many people have already looked at this? Raise your hand. Just even, how many people have not even looked at the practice final? Raise your hand honestly, totally honestly. Hi, so I can see. How many people have completed the, this practice? All right. That pretty much decides it for me that I think for your benefit, it would be better for you, for me, for me to go over this, post a video, so you can watch it whenever you want, of me working through it. Um, and then if you want, and then next time we can go over the problems that you want to go over. How's that? Otherwise, you, most of the benefit will be lost because you haven't even tried it yet. Because I want you to, if you really want to study and you have a lot of time, what you need to do is review first. You know, really review. Look at the, uh, your exams. Um, do, these, do the practice problems online uh, for the parametrics. Look at your homework. Make sure do a review and then take this as a real exam. And then take the Lon Kappa one, which is basically a randomized version of this. Um, so that's really how you should study. If you, and if you have the time, because we have the, you know, if you don't have an exam until, your next exam is until the following week, then you should definitely do that. You have a lot of time. And that would be the, by far the best way to study, rather than try to watch me go through this. And then if you get through that earlier, you, I can post, um, I can post last semester's, I, last semester I went over this. So I can just post the last semester's video of uh, doing this, and then on Tuesday, on Tuesday when you come in, then we can work through the problems that you think you need more help with. How does that sound? But meanwhile, do you want me to do these? Because we've never done these. Do you want to just quickly do these and like, this won't take us very long? Okay, so why don't we do that? Okay. So this is on page 209 in your notes. And um, these aren't quite exactly the same that are the ones that the ones on long cap anyway. These are slightly different. All right. So uh, this is an experiment was done to, uh, and here's the results. These are a pre and post memory test, and um, the numbers indicate the improvement in scores. Okay. So now we want to do small numbers, and it's not very small sample size and not norm, from normal distributions. So we pretty much, we can't do a t-test. So now we're doing this uh, rank sum. So this is very simple. I think you all know how to do this. This is the smallest right here. Then the next one, right, you just put them in ranks. One, two, and then the next one is three, four, five, six, and seven. And make sure there's seven of them. Okay. So now, um, rank some of the drug groups. So you're just going to add those up, and that's, add all those up, 5 plus 6 plus 7, and that's 18. And then add these up, and you see 10. And you add them together, and they sum to 18 plus 10 is 25, and make sure, 28, yeah, duh, and make sure, 28, and make sure that what? Check that they sum to what? Remember the formula. This is something you need to know. That's going to be n, n times n plus 1 over 2. So in this case, it's 7 times 8 over 2, which is 28. So it does check. All right? So these are very, very easy to catch your careless mistakes on this. I would have caught my careless mistake. All right? So if they're no were true, and the null is the drug work no better than a placebo, would the expected value of the two groups be the same? Now let's look at this. Remember what the expected value. Here's this formula for the sum of the ranks. But the expected value depends on, remember the formula for the expected value for the ranks would be n sub i times n plus 1 over 2. 
it would depend on the sample size, right? The bigger, you're just summing these. The bigger the sample size, the bigger the expected value. So, no. All right? All right. And this, so let's look at this. And here's this little chart. Um, you could just, just to check yourself here. So what do we have so far? We have that the drug group has an observed rank of 18. And the other one has 12, and they total to 28. Now here we can put the expected ones in. That's this. So that's n sub i in this case times 8 over 2 times 4, because 4 is the average of the numbers between 1 and 7. So, right? So now uh, for the drug group, it's a sample size of 4. So it's 4 times 8 over 2 and we get 16. And for the placebo group, it's 4, not 4, but what? 3 times 8 over 2, because there's a group of 3. So you'd expect the average. This is a very easy formula to remember. This is the average of the numbers between 1 and n, and this is just the sample size. It's the same as this one. This is just the, the total sum. And this is per, for each group. Instead of having a, the big N here, you just have the group size. All right? So that's 3 times 4 is 12. And of course, they have to sum to 28. Now, another way to check what, what we've seen is the observed minus the expected before you square it, right? Before you square it is going to, this is going to be 2, and this is negative 2, and they have to sum to 0. All right. So now, the, since the sample size are small, what test statistic can we use? Well, they're really small sample sizes. We really shouldn't be using the normal approximation yet until we have a sample size of about seven or, or more. But um, so we should use that exact probability distribution that's based on u stats. So you should be able to, you know how to read that one. But let's say, and I'll probably ask you something like this because so you, just because it's a lot of computations, if I give you sample sizes that are much bigger than, I want to give you small sample sizes so you don't make careless errors. So suppose the sample sizes were bigger and the normal approximation could be used to test this, then um, that, and here's the null and here's the alternative, um, and it's a one-sided alternative that the drug does work better than the placebo, right? The drug is, here it's saying that not only are their means the same, but um, that basically in various seg in all segments of the population, the mean, the one does you don't favor, one, the drug is not better than the placebo. The null is that they're just the same. They're basically like the same drug. And the alternative is no, the drug works better than the placebo in the population for some segments of it. So we have to do our usual z equals the observed minus the expected, right, over some standard error. And so we could use either, we have it right here, our observed for the drug group or the placebo group. They're just going to be opposites of each other. So it doesn't matter which one we use. And we have to, this is going to be given to you, the standard error for the rank sum or the u statistic. This is the standard error for the rank sum. and um, you won't have to remember it. What is it, though? It will be given to you. It's the square root of n times n plus 1, excuse me, n times n plus 1 over 12, right? It's a given to you. Some. Yes. It's given to you right there. All right, I memorized it wrong. So it's the square root of, it's, this is going to be equal to, let's just erase that, sorry about that. It's going to be equal to 2 times, let's look at it, the square root of n1 times n2. So in this case, that's 3 times 4, times n plus 1, which is 8, times 8 over 12. That's what it is. That'll be on the front of your exam. And the sample size times n plus 1. All right? And then you just do that. 
I did it and I got 0 0.71. And that means when you see 0 0.71 as a Z statistic, you should know right away what? That you don't have enough evidence to reject the null. It's not very far out on the tail, is it? Not far out on the tail at all. OK? Everybody should know, basically be able to look at that and just know we're not going to reject it. All right. So we could not reject the null. And now let's look at, um, OK, so now the U statistic. And if I ask you to do, uh, you know, this is, this is these non-parametrics are very nice because you can check your work because you're going to get the same Z statistic you should with the U as you do with the rank sum. So now the U statistic is what? You look at, for each one of these, you see how many um, scores it surpasses. So negative 10 contributes nothing to the, to the drug group because it doesn't beat any of these, right? Four beats both zero and negative five, and nine and 15 beat all three of them. So that's gonna be three and three. Okay, if we wanted to do this one, negative five just beats negative 10, and zero just beats negative 10 again, and five beats two of them, all right? So here, when we add these up, right here we get eight, and we add these up, we get four, and they must sum to what? They do sum to 12, but what they must sum to what? Four times three, it's n1 times n2. So they must sum to 12, and they do. All right. Just because there's four times three pairwise comparisons. Now, um, if the null were true and the drug worked no better, would the expected value of the two groups be the same? Yeah, because they're basically, if you think of them as two teams, they're playing 12 matches. And half of them are going to be won by one. They're just singles matches, right? So half of them are going to be won by one team, or half are going to be won by the other team, is what you'd expect if the teams were of equal strength, if they were equal. And, I, and these are, if the drug and the placebo groups have worked equally, we expect them to have the same use, use scores. So um, yes. All right, so now um, we can do this. We have 8 and 4 and 12. That's what we see. That's what we observed. What did we expect? What we expect is, well, n1 times n2 over 2. 4 times 3 over 2. That there'd be 6 and 6 and 12. And you'll see that the observed minus the expected, again, sums to 0. And it's going to always be the same. And this is what your, uh, you know, when you do a, a Z test, the numerator and the denominator, the denominator is the same for both the, uh, for both tests, and the numerators are the same. These two statistics just differ by a constant between these and the ranks. So they're going to have the same standard errors. Okay. Um, And again, um, with small samples, you have to use the table, those exact probability tables. And um, here's the same question again. Just compute the z-score for the same null and alternative hypothesis, and you know it's going to be the same. It's just the observed minus the expected. It will be 2, and it's going to be over the square root of, we can do it right here, the square root of what? 4 times 3 times 8 over 12. Well, that's really easy to solve. 2 over, four. those cancel out, so it's 2 over the square root of 8. 
which is approximately 0 0.71. It's the same. Okay? Same as we got before. So it's just to show you the logic of it that it's why, you know, just in a simple problem. So that's pretty simple. Any questions on that? Now, let's say we added a third group. Could we still do this rank sum test? No, we'd have to now, all of a sudden, if we add a third group here, now we have to switch to the H statistic and do the um, Kruskal Wallace test. So that's what we're doing here. Suppose we had, and this often happens, you have a drug, a placebo, and then you have a nothing group. Because, you know, the placebo has some effect, a placebo effect, right? So sometimes they have three arms where they do nothing for the third group. So now, uh, let's say that was it. So then you have to combine these into one ordered list and get their ranks right here. So, um, so I did that for you. I wouldn't do that for you. You'd have to see this was the lowest right here, negative 10. And the second lowest is this one, negative 5. And the third lowest would be 0. Now you move to the positive numbers, and these 4, 5, and 6 rank. Now we're after 3 here, we can go over to 7, 8, and these must be 9 and 10. We didn't have any ties here. So that's what it looks like. And now we could just add these up. So the observed rank for the drug group is 27. For the placebo group is 13. And here we have, what, 15. And that sums, sorry, that sums to 55. And now we want to check. What do we want to check? The 55 is what would we're looking at the numbers between 1 and 10. So that's, you know, we have to check that's 10 times n plus 1, 11 over 2. And that is also 55. So that checks. And now, for each one of these, what are we going to do? This is the average of the numbers between 1 and 10. And now, so for each one, we're just going to do the same, remember it's n sub i for each group over n plus 1 over 2. All right, so here we have 4 times 11 over 2. Here we have 3 times 11 over 2 and 3 times 11 over 2. Okay, so that's 22. That's 16.5 and 16.5, the same. And it should sum 33 plus 22 is 55, yes. And now we do the observed minus the expected again. Now, look, um, you're not going to have any charts or to fill in because it's all multiple choice. So, but what I could do is provide, that, like, especially on the, um, the ANOVA charts, those are very, very useful for you to think about. Sometimes what I'll do, probably what I've done, is take uh, a table, an ANOVA table, and just leave some things blank and ask you to fill in the blanks. Or just ask you to fill in specific ones with multiple choice. So I can still provide a few tables like that. But generally, it's going to be more, um, not as many as on some of the other exams. And on the last exam, I didn't provide any tables for you, and I think it was harder because of it. So um, overall, this test is, the final is easier than any of the um, exams. It's just hard because it's comprehensive. In other words, you know, I don't go into as much detail with any one area. It's more general, more the easier problems. But as you'll see when you do the practice final, OK? All right. So now let's just look at this, 27 minus 22. But this is just so you know what's going on. It's very helpful to work through these so you understand how it works. So here you're looking at the observed minus the expected. And always when you look at these observed minus expecteds, they have to sum to 0. That's the way we've, that's why we, that's why we're always squaring these. 
mean, if, if we're going to total them up, when you have multiple groups, you have to look at the whole pattern. And if you add them up, they're just going to be zero. OK, so now we're going to get this statistic and just make sure that you know how, you know how to compute that. So it's going to be, tw you'll get this formula. This will be given to you, but you need to know how to use it. So it's 12 over 10 times 11. And here you're just summing up these differences squared over the sample size. So let's do that. So here we have, I don't need the summation sign. That just means to add them up. So let's just add them up. OK. So 5 squared over its sample size, which is 4, plus negative 3.5 squared over 3, plus negative 1.5 squared over 3. So that's the statistic. And um, one advantage is if you do have to compute this and it's multiple choice, if you make a careless mistake, often your answer won't be on there. So you know you did something wrong, so you, that might be a big advantage of a multiple choice test. All right, so I did this, and I got um, 12, 10, 11 over times 11.03333, and that's the H statistic. Now, that's a chi-square. That's going to be, OK, first off, since the sample sizes are small, what test statistic are we supposed to use? And again, we're supposed to use um, the, this H stat, but look up its exact probability distribution on tables. And I haven't shown you those H tables, but they're very simple. But you just look it up, and you see if that is bigger than the critical value. But that won't be on the exam because we've never looked at it. You just need to know for small samples that's what you're supposed to do. But if the samples are large enough, and there's no exact cutoff, but usually when they're five or six each, something like that or more, um, then you use the chi-squared curves. And to find the, how do you know which curve to look at? You'll need to know this for sure. Chi-squared curves always have degrees of freedom equal to the number of um, parameters minus one, right? And it's the number of groups minus one. Those two things are the same. So the number of groups minus one, the number of parameters minus one. It's like the numerator and the F stat. So it's G minus one. So and that's going to be two degrees of freedom because we have three groups. And what's the critical value? You'd look it up. At, I'd have to give you an alpha here. And you'd just look it up. And you'd have a chi-square table. And in this case, two degrees of freedom. And I asked you for 5%, that's 5.99. So that's what you'd write. And then what would you conclude? Well, you should know right away we're comparing those two numbers, right? We want to see if our number's far enough out on a tail. That's what we always, the bigger our stat is, whatever our test statistic is, is it far enough out on the tail? That's what to reject the null and say, uh-uh, we've got, you know, it's not just the null boring thing of no effect. There's a, an effect here. There's a difference. Yeah, go ahead. For the HSTAT uh, small sample size uh, table, is that based on the sample size? That's based on the sample sizes. You'll, you'd, have it, you'd have to look at on the sample size. It's, it's, it would be a complicated table, OK? So now what we do is this, and just I just want you to know this isn't hard. It's the same for everything. You get some critical value, right? And here, on this chi-square, let's say, with two degrees of freedom, let's say it doesn't really look like this. For two degrees of freedom, this is many more degrees of freedom. It's not shaped like this. But let's just, what you're looking at is for the chi-square is just whatever critical value it is, and we'll mark it with a star. You know, it goes more like that with two degrees of freedom. But you're just looking over here. And this is it out. This means this right here tells you this part is 5%. That's what that tells you. And you've got something. Your H stat is way over here. 
This is this is 5.99. Our yours is like way down here of 1.209. That's your chi square, your h, which okay? So this is like you have a huge p value. You have to have a you have to get a test statistic that's beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? Beyond a reasonable doubt. We can this is just an ordinary innocent old h stat with nothing going on. It's, we don't have strong enough evidence to say, whoa, that's really unusual. The null couldn't be true. It must not be true, because if it was true, it would be very unlikely. That's all we're doing here. So one, this is less, 1.209 is less than 5.99. So you cannot reject the ordinary null dull thing. You know? This is not an unusual thing that's happening. This is just an ordinary, innocent person. <laughs> that's our justice system. It sort of has the same logic of assuming the null, assuming the innocence, assuming nothing's going on. Evidence accumulates, and it gets beyond some point, reasonable doubt. We don't quantify it, and we say, hey, we're going to convict. There's always going to be some doubt. So the p value is like a measure of the doubt if it's really, really tiny. Then we reject this whole situation of innocence, of null, dull, and we say we got some evidence here for a really, un for a more unusual, something's, for an effect, for a real effect. All right, that's the idea. Um, let's keep going. And now look at these three data sets. Okay, for which data set, this is under just understanding what a Spearman rank correlation, what a correlation coefficient is. All right. So if you have a correlation coefficient of 1, that's a line with a positive slope. Well, this one clearly is a line. 1, 1, 2, 2, that's a perfect correlation. So you know its data set 3 is for sure. Are these even lines? Well, you could check the slope. Is that, as you go, this one clearly isn't. Because if you go up 100, here you go up 6. Now you go up another 100, you don't go up 6, you're going up 103. So this doesn't have the same slope throughout. So this is clearly not correlation of 1. This one, as you go from 500 to 600, up 100, well, we can do this. You know, we're just saying, OK. And the, as y goes from 600, OK, 600 minus 500, and 10 minus negative 4. So there we have a slope of 14 over 100, 1.4, is that equal to the next one? So we could just do any other two points. So here as we go from 500 to 400, 500 minus 400, there's 100 in the denominator. Do we also get 14? Do we? Is negative 4 ne minus negative 12? No. There we get 8. So it's not equal. So it's fruit set only this, only 3. Those points do not form a line because they don't have the same slope, same change. All right, same change in x for change in y. So for which data sets is the correlation, is the rank? Now this is super easy. You just change them to ranks. So this one is clearly equal to 1. This is just a perfect correlation, and it's a perfect line. How about the others? How about set 1? So you just change those. OK. So the x's go in order from 1 to 3 and 4. Do the y's also go in the same order? Is that the smallest? And is that the largest? Yes. Negative 6 is the smallest. Then when we rank them, yeah. So set one also, once you change it to rankings, is a, is, has a correlation of one. So how about set number two? We can do the same thing. So set number two. OK, that's the biggest. That's number three. Let's do the x's first. That's two. That's the smallest one. Now, is that 
Yeah. Is that the big, that's number three. That's the biggest. That's in the middle, and that's the smallest. So yeah, they're both. So all of them. All right. It's very easy to see a perfect correlation in a Spearman because they're always just going to be the numbers 1 through n all matched up. If it was a negative correlation, they'd just be the biggest one with the smallest one. They'd sum to the same thing. Like if this was a negative correlation, you'd have um, 1 and 4. They'd just be in reverse order here. They'd have to x plus y would equal the same thing. All right, so now 105 students took it. Okay, so this is something, this is a good, this is one you got wrong on the um, eye clicker, and it's really easy to understand it if you think about it. 105 students took exam two and three. Suppose the averages and SDs for both exams turned out to be exactly the same. What can you conclude? Let's just imagine you were in this situation. What if I told you that on the final, the averages and the standard deviations were the same as they were on your exam three? Would you be able to perfectly predict? Would you know already what score you got on exam three? On the final, just because of that, you'd have no idea. And in fact, a lot, a lot of classes normalize all the exams so they have the same average and same standard deviations. When they do a curve, that's what they usually they normalize them. If they do a, you know, they want to make them to have the same averages and the same standard deviations. And then you don't know what the correlations are. You still don't know, right? Let's say they were the same set of numbers exactly. Let's say you had your exam three scores. And they were the same exact numbers. But let's say I randomly distributed them to you. There'd be no correlation. They'd be the same set of numbers, but it's, the correlation all depends on the pairings. So it doesn't have any, you know, it doesn't help you to know if something's the same average and the same standard deviation, right? Does that make sense? Good. All right. Um, so now, so maybe we should write this. What can you conclude? None of the above. First of all, remember, and I'm, I was trying to understand why so many people got this wrong on the eye clickers, and I think I figured it out, but I'm not sure. Remember that the correlation, remember the correlation R is equal to what? The sum of the zx's times the zy's over n, the product, the sum of their products, right? So changing to z-scores, so figuring out a correlation coefficient means changing to z-scores. So figuring out a, means changing to z-scores. Always makes the x and y values have the same average. Always makes the x and y values have the same average. Have average equal to 0 and standard deviation equal to 1. All right, so that doesn't tell you anything. But it doesn't make them normal. It doesn't make them normal. You can have any weird, just changing to z-scores, Just that's what I think you were getting confused about. Let's do the next question. So repeat part A, adding the extra assumption that both sets of scores are normally distributed. That still doesn't help you. You don't know how they're paired up. So it's still none of the above. You, you know, even if they were normal, you still don't know um, anything about how they're paired up. So now, repeat part A. Not assuming they're normal, just repeat part A, that they have the same average and same standard deviation, but adding this extra piece of information. The student who was the top score on both exams, the same student, ranked number one, so when you change them to rankings, every student has the same ranking on each. They're ranked the same way. So you know right away, you know, the top person who got was the third highest score on one of the exams will be the third highest score on the other. So the rankings are going to exactly match up. So obviously, this is true. But a lot of people thought that was true as well, and they'd be both equal to one. And that would be true only if they were normally distributed both of them. But um, just changing to z-scores does not make them normally distributed. So they can have two sets of scores, and one can be really 
the rankings can be very, they're not going to have the same cor regular correlation because maybe what, you know, the top scorer could have gotten a perfect score on the first exam, and then on the next exam, maybe the top scorer was only, in, you know, didn't do as well, or there was a huge gap between the first and second scores. That would show up in the actual values, but not in the rankings. Unless they were normally distributed, and then it means they have the same spacings. Yeah? So, if you took um, part PD, how would you change it such that the answer would be Oh, let's say I did that, then, so his good question. His question is, how would you change it so that the answer would be that this is also true? So, I'd just change, I'd say, repeat. I'd say repeat part B, where they're adding, doing exactly the same thing. Okay? Because part B adds the extra assumption of normality. So instead of saying repeat part A, adding this extra piece of information, repeat part B, adding this extra piece of information. Because B says normally distributed. So, and then the answer would be what? Then the answer would be R. S equals 1, and it also equals R. They're both the same. No. Good question. Is there ever a time when R equals 1, but R S doesn't equal? No, because if R equals 1, R S is, has to equal 1. Right? Because if R equals 1, all the points fall in a line. So that means all the rankings are going to be on a line, too. So. That's a good question. All right. Let's see what else there is. If we decide to do a non-parametric test and use the Spearman correlation coefficient to test the null hypothesis, that the population correlation is zero, then the appropriate test statistic for small samples is the spear, it's their tables. There's the, for all of them, there's exact probability distributions because there's such small no amount of numbers and the numbers are so easy, you can figure out, the numbers are uniform between one and however n, you can figure out the exact probability distributions. And otherwise, it's a z-test. And notice, it's never, they're never going to be T or F tests for this because we know the standard deviation of the, once we get the rankings, we know the standard deviations. Um, let's see what else. So that's that. You know what I think people are probably going to need help with is this, what you probably forget is power a lot. And that was another very conceptual um, chapter. Um, so I'm sure we're going to have to go over this. Probably it's best if you look at it on your own first, OK? So I'll be sending you more information if I decide to add anything else to the exam that's, I'll send you an email about it. And there's office hours from now until reading day, 4 to 6 p.m. in 23, Alina Hall.